Thanks to Robert and the Restoration Seminar for having me back. I presented in fall of 2017, and it was a very introductory uh, presentation to uh, this site and, and what we've been working on with, related to beaver mimicry. So we're excited to come back and share what we have and some of the results that we're seeing and some of the uh, you know, implications to restoration as far as beaver mimicry devices in the Black Tail Creek watershed. And, Thank you to my committee members for showing up. Uh, you know, this isn't a thesis <laughs> defense, so I'll try to keep Almost. it as uh, <laughs> I'll try to keep it as uh, low key as possible and and connect with you guys as best I can. Uh, but you'll see a lot of data in here, so just be prepared for that. So scope of presentation, typical project background and the restoration technique we're using. I'm going to go over the site description, monitor, monitoring equipment, and the methods that we've been using. Surface and groundwater data, temperatures. Flux estimations, looking at flow to and from the stream and to and flow from groundwater. And then some conclusions and recommendations based off what we found over about four years worth of monitoring years. So this project could not be possible without uh, the involvement of many different folks. And so first starts off with the private landowners. There's a lot of this work going on on Blacktail Creek on private parcels. If it wasn't for them inviting us and allowing us to do this restoration, monitoring, going through their closed gates, uh, we couldn't you know, obviously have any of this. So Amy Chadwick, kind of the, the head honcho, she started this project. Robert Powell, Muhammad Khalil, Ted Dodge uh, with the Watershed Restoration Coalition. He got funding from the Wildlife Conservation Society, got a rep them, and uh, they received a climate adaptation grant back in 2016. And that's kind of funded a lot of this project and the partners that you see up here. So kicking it off, you know, climate assessment. This is a great document, just an overall assessment of what Montana is going to look like over the next pretty much 100 years. So what I'm showing here is four graphs from the climate assessment. And this RCP, RCP is a representative concentration pathway. And so that represents pretty much an emission scenario. So we have low emission scenarios on the top and then high emission scenarios from 2040 to 2069 and then 2070 to 2099. So kind of the latter half of the century. And what you can see is that we're going to get warmer, right? So this is going to impact a lot of different things, including snowpack, changes in precipitation, more uh, rainfall opposed to snowpack, uh, longer growing season, increased uh, temperatures in the summer. And so, you know, this is something that all of us in Montana are going to face. And, you know, it's kind of up to restoration and restoration ecologists, hydrologists, hydrogeologists, everything in between to come up with some answers to what we can do to try to mitigate the impacts of climate. So with that, on top of the uh, the climate warming up, we have this lack of beaver in some of these areas as well. So this is a 95 photograph on Blacktail Creek up in the headwaters on the left. You can see the immense uh, extent of the beaver ponds that used to be there. And then a 2017 photo that was taken showing the lack of beaver ponds in those areas. And so we've had a breaching of dams, a loss of beaver through trapping, predation, and disease. Those three have really influenced beaver populations across North America. And so as we see these decreases in ponds, we see also a decrease in stream complexity, uh, you know, pond extents, and great habitat for, for fish and wildlife too. So in 2017, you can see that even post-restoration, this is a picture after restoration, it'd be really hard for humans to, to mimic the extent of what a beaver could do to an area. So speaking of beavers, I'll go through a few things, right? They're known as the keystone species or ecosystem engineer. They provide ecosystem services for a variety of different habitats and different animals across uh, pretty much all of North America. They build dams, dig narrow channels to allow themselves to move through and swim through. And they also alter the vegetation through uh, browsing. They also increase the retention of materials. And so what I mean by that is they increase sediment retention, they increase water retention, and they also increase any debris flow that might be coming down. 
They improved the lateral connectivity with the stream itself. And so a beaver dam creating a high head or an increase in water depth allows water to flow to it, through and around the stream systems. It also increases the vertical exchange in groundwater flow. And then lastly at the bottom here, beaver dams are known to attenuate flow and increase base flow in some cases on some streams. So those are just some things to consider when we're using beaver or looking at impacts of beaver in a watershed. And I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with that. So as far as bringing our ecosystems back and having historic beaver ponds be replaced, we put in these beaver mimicry structures. And so this is a beaver mimicry structure on Basin Creek. And you can see that it's primarily uh, conifer post with sedge sod mats on the front end here. And then we have this nice run that we get to a next beaver mimicry structure downstream. So they're built in sequence. They support one another. And there's conifer weaving in between. And overall, you know, you could see a good amount of water built up behind it. But it's not, you know, quite the extent of, you know, a beaver pond itself. So it's kind of an introduction to just uh, beaver mimicry structures. Here's another uh, example, a little bit more messy, right? This is kind of like <coughs> what you'd ideally picture. And then in reality, you know, it, it's not bad to have something like this. And so this is on another drainage up in the Basin Creek area. And it's just showing that on a side trip, we have structures placed a little bit lower of a gradient and greater groundwater and pond storage in those areas. So as I'm talking about Basin 1 and Basin 2, those were examples from both of those sites up here. And on the right side, you can see the Blacktail Creek treatment sites and the control sites. And so all of these areas are equipped with monitoring both above and below the restoration to give us a baseline on how the beaver dam analogs or the beaver mimicry structures impact uh, flows and groundwater levels through these tributaries. And so a uh, handful of stuff on both of these uh, drainages. And so with beaver mimicry installation, you know, this is kind of the fun part. You can't just, uh, I'm being sarcastic because permitting is probably the least fun part of uh, some of this restoration work. The actual implementation and the, uh, the installation of the structures is the fun part. But a 404 wetland permits, uh, EPA and the Clean Water Act, they identify that you need to regulate the discharge of dredged or fill material into waters in the United States, and that includes wetlands. So as we're clogging up these streams, we're actually putting in what's considered fill material and requires a wetland permit and also wetland delineation. So these BDAs or low-tech structures still require the same amount of, I guess, uh, initial uh, monitoring to have them in place as like a larger, uh, a larger construction project. And so with that, there's looking or there's folks who are looking at increased ways to uh, improve the ability to put in the beaver mimicry structures. So one of those is using private land agreements. You can use NRCS, which is Natural Resource Conservation Services. And they allow uh, folks to come in to the site and you can actually sign off without doing a wetland delineation. As long as the landowner is there and someone from a federal agency, uh, the EPA and the Clean Water Act and the Army Corps of Engineers will allow that permit to go through and it kind of streamlines the process. But with that, there is still an ambiguous understanding of what's considered low impact. You know, if you're out there with machinery and you're creating the graded riffles where it's primarily sediment buildup rather than conifer posts, is it still low tech or low impact? It's to be you know, determined still, so we don't, we don't quite know. But there is enough uh, leverage on these projects that people are, are trying to make them easier to implement because it, the wetland delineations make a very easy project, more expensive, and a little bit of a longer process, too. So with that, as we go into the beaver mimicry structures, what we're really trying to understand is the groundwater surface water interactions in and around the stream, the structure itself, and also through the system. So as you can see here, this is just a nice schematic that shows kind of everything in a water budget that might be close to the stream. So we have discharge to groundwater, recharge to the stream, 
Uh, we have riparian zone infiltration. We have evaporation runoff. And obviously a low water table during later in the summer and then a high water table during the runoff periods. And so what we're looking at is how does the impact of beaver mimicry structures impact the, some of these processes that are going on. So some of our study objectives are kind of what I just stated. Spatial and temporal relations of ground or recharge and surface water discharge at a BDA site. So we're looking at both temporal and spatial relationships of BDA sites. And then we also want to look at how does it change from a runoff period during high flow to a low period where there's no precipitation. Another thing we're looking at is stream flows, just total stream flow throughout the years, both pre and post restoration, and also late season flow. Do the impact flow later in the year? Can we detect it based off what we're collecting out in the, in the, in the field? And then lastly, more groundwater and surface water interactions. So utilizing temperature as a tracer, also spe specific conductance, or you know, in lamest terms, the amount of salts that are in a water body. And then using those to determine a magnitude and also direction of flow in and around some of these structures. So with that, we have equipment. And then we have 103 groundwater posometers across uh, five different sites. So that includes three on Blacktail Creek and three on Basin Creek. We have 14 surface water monitoring locations, 14 stream transducers with those surface water monitoring locations to develop a continuous rating curve. And you can continuously track stage, which is related to discharge, which I'll talk about later. And then five flux stations. And so these flux stations are equipped with eye buttons, and they can fit in a nice one inch well, and they can help you track how temperature changes from the stream itself to deeper in the sediments. Uh, and you can see here, this is a typical monitoring schematic. We have a piezometer, which we'll talk about in the next slide. We have a staff gauge here with a stilling well equipped with a transducer. And then we have that flux station I was talking about that goes into the sediment. And what we're really trying to understand is how do these, how do these uh, uh, fluxes or flow to and from the stream change over time? So with that, I wanted to just throw in a few examples of some monitoring methods. And so this is a nice schematic for wetland monitoring. And I throw this in here because we worked with an ecologist to start the, this, this kind of project off. And she uh, gave us 3 quarter inch wells installed in our, um, in our system, which is great. But it's nice to have a larger, uh, a larger well, or a larger piezometer is what we call them, to have transducers in place in them. So you can track how groundwater changes over time. But as you can see, the monitoring well is typically screened where water can flow to and from the well over a longer interval, where the piezometer itself is kind of measured just from one point, so one point at the bottom here. And so this is just kind of an easy way to look at, you know, we have bentonite at the top, which protects any infiltration of water, and then we have a sand mixture at the bottom, which allows groundwater and surface water well, groundwater in this case, just to move into the piezometer. So something to consider there. Uh, one thing we look at with the vertical gradients is it's a physical measurement. So the vertical gradients is the change in head over two, uh, two different measuring points, but in the same spatial location. So we have a measuring point here and a measuring point there. And so in this piezometer setup, we see a downward connection in flow. And in this one on the right, we see an upward connection in flow. So it just gives you an idea <coughs> excuse me, of which way flows are moving by using a shallow and a deeper uh, monitoring location. With using temperature as a tracer, uh, temperature is driven by these four processes, evection, conduction, radiation, and convection. Uh, I won't get into those too much. But when I was mentioning how you can tell whether water's moving up or down, it's based off of how does the deeper sediments reflect the stream temperature itself. So the diel signal throughout the day, the highs and the lows, if the lower uh, buttons or the lower temperature trackers have a similar signal than the stream does, you can assume a losing reach, where if it's muted or there's almost no signal compared to the, the stream itself, then you would assume a gaining reach. So these are just a few things uh, to consider as we move forward here that 
And these are our monitoring methods. And so with that, we also use stage rating curves or stage discharge curves. And so we're out there collecting a point in the field from almost honestly a ruler out, out uh, in the stream itself. And we're collecting a, a flow at that measured stage. And so we can develop this rating curve that says at some stage we have some discharge. And if we have a continuous track of stage, we can develop a continuous discharge over time as well. So these are kind of, this is a method we use to develop surface water balances or surface water hydrographs for both 2018 and 2019. Here are a few site layouts. So this shows that we have beaver mimicry structures placed here on uh, Basin Creek. And then we have piezometers that are set up in kind of this three, four, five orientation. So we get a nice distribution across the entire floodplain to see what are the groundwater levels doing closer to the stream and what are they doing further from the stream. And are these BDA structures actually impacting further from the stream. Uh, on the right side, I don't expect you to see that, but it kind of gives you a good orientation of we're collecting from a large width of this entire system and that we're not just focused on the stream itself. We're working up on the floodplain. We're working on this tributary and we're also looking uh, spatially through the system. Drone flights. And so I had uh, Micah, who, uh, Gregory, who is part of the geoscience uh, grad program. He came out and helped uh, fly a drone and collect a topographic surface of the Blacktail Creek site. And so a uh, 40 uh, gigabyte file produced uh, a two or one centimeter DEM uh, throughout this entire system. So I just want to thank him for coming out and doing this. I, uh, I gave him a nice present uh, for, the, for, his, for his services here. But I'll show you a, a quick video and a result of kind of what drones can do nowadays, which is pretty neat. So I'll look, just kind of let you guys watch it first. Pretty cool. I think we're doing good on time, so I might, might just play it again and I'll talk through it because uh, I like it that much. So we're flowing through the control site here. This is on Blacktail Creek. You can notice, you can see it's pretty dark. Notice the incision that is in that location. Uh, generally, uh, willows and alders through this meadow here, and then we come into the treatment site where we have structures in place, a breach and a dam, and then kind of meandering through Blacktail continues down. And then it will hit, uh, hit the uh, kind of the a pinch point and start heading north uh, even more and then downstream. But this is a very uh, shallow gradient system, historic beaver meadow with historic beaver ponds similar to the site or the, the pictures that I had shown kind of to start this off. Another way we can, other than topography, to characterize our system is to perform hydraulic conductivity tests. So in general, this is how well water flows through the system, or how well does sediment allow water to move uh, through the system. And so there's a few different ways we can uh, use to, to look at this, and that includes a slug test, and that's putting in a measured amount of volume to a uh, piezometer and measuring how quickly it drops. And so it's just, uh, you know, really it's an initial, initial height and then how quickly that responds. You can see that this is a fairly straight line all the way down. And even my line here could be a little bit more on there. But in general, you know, you can see that there's a pretty linear, linear uh, relationship. One other method you can use to test hydraulic conductivity is a soil analysis or a sieve analysis. And what we're looking for is a D10 particle size. So that's 10% finer. What, what number here, what sieve opening uh, gives us that 10% that would go into a few uh, sieve equations or uh, soil analyses equations um, that take into account porosity and also this D10. 
So what we came up with just initially was 1.8 meters per day. And that's generally a, uh, a, a silty, sandy, uh, not so much gravel, some clays in there as well, but kind of a nice uh, heterogeneous mixture of different things, um, including silt, sands, and clays. Through electrical resistivity and seismic reflection measurements that uh, the Montana Tech Geophysics Field Camp took, we generally see uh, in our area that we have this fractured granite material um, with weathered uh, material at depth and then an aquifer thickness of about, I would say, 115 to 75 feet, depending on where you are in the floodplain. So when we're looking for an aquifer, what we're not looking for is uh, some of that you know, hard rock granite, but that fraction material certainly serves as a conduit or an ability for water to still flow through. Um, so you can see here that generally as you move across, it drops down and then it comes back up and you have shallow bedrock on the sides of the floodplain and you have kind of this, this uh, faulting system that allows it to go straight down. So those are just a few methods. Um, to kind of get an, a general aquifer characterization, what type of areas are we working in? So with that, we'll start getting into some data. There's a lot of graphs here, so I'll try to uh, not bore you guys too much, but just try to stay in tune. This is, this is one of a few. So this is Basin Creek uh, snow tell uh, measurements, and this is from water year uh, 2016 to water year 2019, so we're talking October to October. So it's actually kind of an interesting graph. So you have, in 2016, we have these high water years, and this is snowpack, the yellow line. And then these lines here that are individual rectangles are the daily precipitation. And so as you can see that uh, 2016 and 2018 are very similar years. Uh, 2017, a lower year. 2019, even a lower year. Uh, we all remember what was happening there, Robert. We got our morels in the spring of 2018 because of this, right? That was the fire season. So there was no snow, there was no precip for a good time period in there. So it's kind of interesting to see that and uh, how that might impact data as well. This shows annual hydrographs. So we have average daily flow. Uh, I'm preparing a paper right now, so I'm everything in metric. So apologies for that if you're not a metric person. But cubic meters per second, it's more uh, relevant to look at the uh, amounts and the amplitudes rather than the numbers itself. So, so you can see for the four year period, uh, 2016 relatively low for, snow, for stream flows at the USGS gauging station at Blacktail Creek. Uh, 2017 a little bit higher. 18, big water year. And then 2019, uh, generally uh, just a slightly water lower water year than 2018. So the blue is the Blacktail Creek the USGS, and then the orange is at our sites. Generally on Blacktail Creek, you know, we're seeing in a magnitude lower flow just because we're higher up in the watershed. So it's good uh, comparison of sites over multiple years. So getting into data that we collected, uh, I'd like to thank Amy Chadwick for going out there and, and collecting a few data points for me before pre-restoration. Uh, one big thing just to note is collect as much data pre-restoration as, as possible. Um, having these two points gives us a baseline, but really not as much as we'd like to see um, you know, comparing multiple years of data. So this shows that stage readings, so we have meters above sea level on the y-axis, and then this is for pretty much the summer period. So we have April 29th to October 21st on this slide. Uh, and it shows that 2017, 18, and 19, we had an increased stage or the level of water at all of our sites compared to pre-restoration. So this is both restoration sites, upstream treatment, and the downstream treatment on the bottom. And it just shows that we're elevated by you know, almost a quarter of a meter, which is close to a foot uh, in elevation. So that's, that's a good thing, that we see this increase in stage and that we're increasing uh, the sediment capture as a result of that. So I'm going to go through a few slides here and it shows the difference between the control site, if we consider the upstream control and the downstream control, 
and the difference between the treatment site. And so that's the upstream treatment and the downstream treatment. What happens as we collect data through those systems? And so this is one way to look at it. I compiled cumulative flow differences. And so I have on here is 2018 and 2019 controls and treatments. And in general is what we see is that during the lower water year, which was 2019, we see a gain throughout the treatment site of water. In the control site, we see this loss. And so we see this discharge to groundwater. And then we see this recharge back to the stream. In 2018, higher water year, obviously the, those numbers are going to be a little bit more extreme. So we're seeing this greater increase in uh, recharge to the stream itself. And then we see this greater decrease or increase in discharge to the groundwater. And so you can see that for the runoff period, generally they show that the treatment sites increase flow throughout the summer, while the control sites lose flow throughout the summer. Evan, can I ask something? Yeah, please. Is that really meters per cube per second, or is that cubic feet per second? Because those numbers, you had like one, two, and three, and here you've got 80 and 100. Great question, and thank you for calling me out on that. So I have cumulative flow differences. And so over time that we have this greater increase in flow earlier in the year, and that's what kind of bumps us up to those changes. And then as you can see, we kind of flatten out later in the year. And so these, it, I guess it's more, it's more noticeable during runoff periods as you're increasing the complexity of the stream. There's water flowing to and from in the control and the treatment site. And then later in the year, it almost flattens out. But it's that cumulative flow difference that makes it, uh, makes it uh, those high numbers like that. And you know, average CFS, if we're looking at that in these sites, you know, is around two cubic feet per second when you consider the whole year. This site, or this uh, graph, shows pre-restoration groundwater elevation on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have post-restoration. So we're comparing 2016 pre-restoration with 2017, 18, and 19. So the, the black line here is a one-to-one -one relationship. So if it falls on the line, there was no change during any of those years. If it falls above the line, we see an increase in groundwater over those years. I guess the big thing to note on this is in 2017, we see generally, you see this line wavering from the one-to-one -one as kind of an initial response to restoration. Where in 17, or excuse me, in 18 and 19, we're still on the line or almost on the one-to-one -one line. So it kind of indicates that our sites are settling and that they might be a little more uh, impactful across the whole site during that first year post-restoration. And then as you move further along, if they're not maintained, and you have this one-to-one -one line where they're not changing. This slide shows Blacktail Creek groundwater change throughout the summer of 2019. So it's two data points that I've collected and I'm showing up here. And a few of you guys have seen this already. Uh, but it shows that uh, we're looking at the average water table drop in centimeters across the two sites from June 18th to August 29th. So the bigger the dot, the greater the drop. And the smaller the dot, the less the drop. In the control site, we generally have larger dots. And that's indicated here where we have an average of about 22 centimeters of a groundwater drop over those two months, with 12 of those dry wells increasing greater than 32. So I took a water level meter. I went to the bottom of those wells, and I did not find water. And so that indicates that they've increased greater than that amount. And the dry wells are shown with a dot in the middle. The treatment site shows a lot less dry wells, for one, and also a lot smaller of dots. It's also to note that the small dots are generally close to the stream, where in the control site, the dots are kind of distributed all over the place. There's no really correlation between groundwater drop and distance from stream. But as you move in the, in the treatment site, you see this initial, uh, initial drop further 
from the stream up on the bench of the floodplain where some of these BDA structures might not be impactful. But closer to the stream, generally see smaller dots. And so it's kind of that climate resilience that we're looking for as far as being able to store water and keep it elevated for longer in the season. Uh, where in the control reach, this flume-like action I was mentioning, the incision that's along here, uh, allows water to just stay in the stream and does not connect and interact with any groundwater nearby. We looked at two-week post-restoration, two-week pre-restoration data. So we had restoration in Basin Creek occur in the middle of October. I took, I took groundwater measurements at the beginning of October and at the end of October. And it just shows a nice curve that indicates that when you're closer to the stream, you're going to have an increase in groundwater elevations. As you move further away, the impact of the BDA structure is less evident. Now, if we consider that the groundwater might be filling up, the aquifer might be filling up over time, uh, it's hard to say on this small of a site. But from this last slide, I presume that the groundwater relatively, in, in these single thread channels like this, the groundwater stays at the same, or it, it stays at a higher elevation only close to the stream and is impacted seasonally by precipitation or snowpack further away. So there isn't as much climate resilience further from the stream, but close, if you're thinking about a riparian area, you're gonna see an initial increase right next to the stream itself. We put on the graph and a couple, a couple more one-to-one -one lines, which I believe present the data well and show uh, changes in groundwater over multiple years in a, in a nice way. So this shows the 2018 groundwater elevation on the x-axis and the 2019 on the y-axis. And so 2018, big water year, this is in June, so we assume that all the snowpacks come off, our aquifers are raised, we have, we have our system recharged. Uh, in June, in the control site, you can see this off the one-to-one -one line. So that means that, in general, 2019 was less than 2018, and it shows in our data as well. Where in the treatment site, sure, 2019 had less water than 2018, but it stays on that one-to-one -one line pretty close. And so even these slopes 0.88 and 0.47, you can see that it's, it's uh, more representative of 2018, the treatment site is, than the control site. Um, also note the R squared value that there's a tighter distribution here and a fairly evenly distributed groundwater elevation change in the control site versus the treatment. And to numbers to back those up, uh, control site changed almost 15 centimeters over those two years, and the treatment site changed just under uh, 0.75 centimeters. We also looked at uh, temperatures over our sites, and this is obviously important for uh, aquatic habitat, amphibians, fish, uh, and also plants as well. And so this shows the maximum daily temperatures in one treatment site for 2019. And so it shows that in general, the stream itself is warmer than the pond. And so over the entire summer, May to October, in a restoration site where they're both impacted by beaver mimicry structures, uh, the pond maintains a cooler temperature. And this could be you know, the physical properties of water. It takes a lot of energy to change uh, the temperatures of water. And also, there could be some upwelling of groundwater into the system. And as you have a greater pond, you, you know, have a greater distribution of temperature as well. And, and it could be dependent on where, those, where my temperature transducer was placed. Uh, but I still believe that the pond maintains a cooler temperature than the stream. Uh, and the stream being higher, you might be able to uh, presume that there could be a losing effect during the entire system, during the entire summer of uh, 2019, and then a gaining, like I said, upwelling of groundwater in the pond. This, uh, this slide's a little messy, but it shows that there's a greater change in maximum and minimum daily temperatures in the 
2017 control site versus the 2017 treatment site. So post-restoration, what we're looking at is a decreased diel signal or maximum minimum versus the 2017 pre-restoration site. And so if we look at the numbers over here to kind of clarify a little bit better, we can see that in 2017, our average control site temperature was 12.9, and then in 2019 was 11.3. So we, we cooled off over those two periods. The treatment site, rather, it warmed up over those two periods. And so after restoration, the BDA structures or the beaver mimicry are actually increasing temperatures downstream and they wouldn't impact anything upstream. But that change between the two sites shows that we are generally increasing temperatures uh, in these systems. And this is partially due to the increase in stage. You're, you're creating a greater exposure to, uh, to sunlight, but also you might be losing water through these systems as a result of the BDAs, especially later in the year. So that's something to consider is that water is actually coming out and we don't see a whole lot of groundwater coming in, especially on these small tributaries right in the middle of the summer where temperatures are the warmest. Another way we can look at groundwater and surface water interactions, we're moving through a lot of these slides, so thanks for hanging with me. It's, it's, uh, it's all pertinent or information, but this is total dissolved solid change. And so what we went out and did was we collected specific conductance measurements. So this is the amount of salt that is in the stream. And so it shows a, this graph in particular shows a load of a certain, uh, certain I guess, uh, concentration over time. So we have from June 2019 until August, or September rather, 2019. And what we're looking at is the change, once again, through the control and the change through the treatment sites. And so in general, if we calculate the load of salts through the system with surface water measurements and specific conductance measurements, if it's above the one-to-one -one line, we see a gaining impact. If it's below, we see a losing. So in general, earlier in the year, we see this gaining through the treatment site. We see a slight losing up to a gaining again and then kind of just falls down and I'm not sure what exactly exp explains that but in general for the con for the treatment site we see this gaining throughout the system with less gaining later in the year where in the control site we see this extreme losing during high flow periods and we have less salts in the water indicating more discharge to groundwater rather than recharge to surface water and it just shows that in general, we have this losing effect throughout that control system. This next slide shows sediment fluxes. And so I mentioned that you can detect which direction water is flowing through uh, the temperature buttons placed in a vertical profile throughout the stream. So this is an example of temperature profile at one of our treatment sites. And it shows that in general, we have this diel signal. The dark blue is the stream itself. And we have upper and lower buttons here that show a very similar relationship with the stream. And so over August to September 2019, we see this losing system uh, through, uh, through temperature button and temperature uh, tracers. So with that, you can use vertical gradients, which I discussed earlier, as the changes in stage from a measuring point and hydraulic head at, the, at that measuring point. And our 1D Temp Pro, which is a computer program which analyzes both the phase and amplitude uh, ch changes um, from the stream as you detect uh, temperature at different depths. And so in general, for August and September 2019, we see a losing almost through the whole system with a gaining later in the year uh, at the downstream treatment. There's a slight gain here based on vertical grad gradients, but overall between the physical and the physical measurements I collect out in the field and the physical measurements from the temperature buttons themselves, we see a, a fairly strong correlation between um, the 1D Temp Pro uh, analysis and the physical gradients we've collected out there. So water's flowing out of the system. 
But with that, I could, I could calculate a Darcy flow estimate of water flowing to and from the stream by taking a wetted perimeter, the stream distance, so we have two lengths, and then we also have a, a K value, which I discussed earlier through my sieve analyses, and that's about two meters per day. And so this Darcy estimate gives you the amount of volume per time that water is flowing in one direction. So what I'm seeing here is that in the blacktail control, we see about 21 cubic meters per day of a loss in the treatment, just a little bit above that, so actually pretty close. But the flow differences I calculated out in the field were quite a bit higher than that. So if I did a surface water balance over that time period, it's almost a magnitude greater, so almost 10 times. So it leads me, leads me to believe that there's slightly variable hydraulic conductivity throughout the system, is that the 1.79 meters per day that I assume through my sieve analyses and my slug tests uh, is low. And so this system is actually very productive and, and, and has variable layers of sand, silts, and clays and weathered material. And so if I consider a hydraulic conductivity of, of 1.7 or 17, you know, it, it's reasonable for these systems. Another way that another grad student will look at how groundwater and surface water interactions change with beaver mimicry restoration is to model it. And so this is a DEM surface that we got from that drone flight. And then we have this estimated depth of bedrock. And this is kind of me just having fun one afternoon and uh, creating a just a, I guess, conceptual idea of what, what a, a site might look like. But if we were to model this, we put in structures along that stream, and what we would do is mimic what's happening out in the field. So we have this, this stream coming down, we have this beaver mimicry structure which raises, raises the stream bed elevation, raises the surface water stage, increases complexity in the stream itself, and has water flowing to and from it, and we'll have it increase in stage, and then we'll have it drop. And so really, the goal is just to have a well-calibrated model with field-collected data, and then also to mimic what an actual structure does to the sediment and geomorphic complexity of the streams themselves. So some of my conclusions include, the groundwater increases are limited in distance by single-threaded channels, but there's still potential resilience to climate. And so as you move further away from the stream, you're not gonna see the same increases in groundwater as you would close. Uh, but if you worked in a, in a meandering, high sinuosity stream and putting beaver mimicry structures along that stream, then you might see uh, increases in groundwater across the entire floodplain, where in our sites, it's very site specific. The stream only increases surface water storage by a small amount, thus increasing groundwater only by a small amount. Increased stream stage increases uh, hyperic exchange flows. So that's flow in between the surface and the groundwater. There's a mixing zone there in the treatment site. And I believe that's due to the increased stage in those locations where we have water flowing around. We create this gradient between the stream and the groundwater, where in the control site, it's almost like a flume. Water doesn't really stay high for very long, so it doesn't have a chance to recharge the aquifer. Um, but in the treatment site, generally it does. Late season flows, difficult to quantify. That's kind of the thing that, that everybody wants to know. Do they increase late season flows? I found that they didn't. Uh, in the treatment reach, we see this kind of losing or neutral trend over that, over that time period. Uh, temperatures, generally as we discussed, increased in treatment sites. And then the pond temperatures buffered the overall temperature of the stream through upwelling or you know, a, a spatial distribution of temperature, which might not, might not all be the same. So some, some conclusions there. As we move forward and look into the permitting processes especially, I believe there needs to be a standard for monitoring BDAs and beaver mimicry uh, in wetlands. I think there's uh, studies that have been happening across the state, but I think we need a, a, a better regime on how to do that. It's important to consider the aquifer substrate. I had talked about hydraulic conductivity, but you want to balance a nice, uh, a nice area to work in with the ability to store water and release water. So if you're working in clays, 
you're generally not going to see enough water moving through fast enough. Uh, if you're working in sands, it's going to be work. It's going to be moving through too fast. And so to have a nice balance of clays, silts, and sands gives you that balance between ability to store water and ability to move it through the system. It's also important to consider the gradient of your groundwater and the systems you're working in. Obviously, the stream slope and the vegetation types. I had mentioned I, I think it's a good idea to model the impacts at a high resolution. Uh, there's been some studies looking at like 10 meter impacts of you know, beaver mimicry and beavers, um, but these could be quite a bit higher than that, you know, one meter resolution to see how it impacts different things. Uh, another important thing, access the structures regularly. I mentioned that they kind of settle and that you need to go out there and maintain and look at the structure on an annual basis. This deadfall here creates great complexity in the stream and there are also easy large woody debris jams uh, that you don't have to go out and create. So in our control site even, we had a few of these come down and that's just the nature of the system. that You're going to have this sediment capture and increased uh, sinuosity in the stream just due to um, one of these deadfalls. And then as always, no one size fits all approach. You know, I, I, I use all of these you know, conclusions and, and recommendations, but you know, unless, unless you understand the system you're working in, you won't know what's the best approach or what's the best beaver mimicry or low tech in restoration technique you should use. Um, you know, we're working in high uh, Blacktail Creek. It's quite different. It's in the Boulder Bathlift. You know, it could be quite a bit different than an area you're working in down in Colorado or Utah. Uh, but the more data that's collected and the more we understand these systems, I think the more that the permitting process will be easier and also, you know, the ability to, to understand what you might impact as far as groundwater and surface water interactions um, will be there. So it will kind of guide those recommendations on your site specific area. With that, I'd like to have any questions if we have time and appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. You.